as you all probably know, respiratory infections are a great burden on health, the health system, and vi viruses are the main pathogens that cause these diseases. Viral respiratory infections, luckily, they are usually mild and self-limiting, meaning that most people don't even need to go to the doctor. On the other hand, virtually everybody gets them through their life before the age of three. About 1% to 2% of those who are infected with these infections, they need to go to hospital. And about 10% of those who are admitted to hospital, they need intensive care unit admission. About 50% of those who are admitted to ICU, they have no known risk factor. And this is a true example of an extreme representation of a common, common infection, an extreme phenotype. Based on that, we developed a hypothesis that healthy children who develop unusually severe symptoms of an infection with respiratory viruses, they have rare genetic defects that make them susceptible. To test this hypothesis, we started recruiting patients in Switzerland and in Australia three, more than three years ago. We could collect 120 cases and we performed exome sequencing and in some cases RNA sequencing from blood samples on these patients. Now, if you're familiar with this kind of delta data, you know that there, there is a great amount of data you receive per patient. Each patient has about 40,000 variants, and it's not a trivial task at all to find the causal variants from this wealth of genetic data. For that, we had to restrict our search space, and in our case, we did it based on the prevalence of our phenotype, which was extremely rare, and the fact that these infections, the this representation of these common infections is little in the absence of modern medical care. So we started by looking at complete gene knockout events. Doing so, we found seven genes that were completely knocked out in our cohort due to rare or very rare loss of function mutations. The gene that immediately caught our attention here was IFIH1, also known as MDA5. It is a gene, a, a pattern recognition receptor. It has a chief role in innate immunity against the RNA viruses. Here on the top panel, you see the gene of IFIH1. The red vertical lines you see is the places that we found, is the mutations, the three loss of function mutations that we found, and each arrow relates them to one exon in mRNA of the gene. The mutations that we found, one of them was a stop gain, the two other were two splice site donors that I will talk about in a few, a few seconds. On the lower panel, you see the 3D structure of the protein of IFIH1, and the yellow parts are the parts that are predicted to be lost in the, due to each mutation. Altogether, we had one patient with one homozygous loss of function and seven patients with, uh, with the heterozygous loss of function mutations. Out of these eight, six were infected with RSV and two with the coronaviruses. Here is the result of our RNA sequencing for the, one of the splice donor mutations that I just told you about. What you see here is the, the, on the y-axis is the depth of coverage, the, the times that you read through a, a mutation or a splice site. And on you see exon 13, exon 14, and exon 15 of the gene. Each curve between the blocks, each curve that you see between the blocks, show the number of reads that support the presence of a splice junction. Here on green, you see the reference genotype, the wild type genotype. On yellow, you see the heterozygous, and in red, you see the homozygous. What should be noticeable here is on the, hetero, on the homozygous genotype, you don't see exon 14, you see exon 13, there are reads on exon 13 and on exon 15, but it seems that exon 14 is skipped, and it's even more reassuring to look at the heterozygous phenotype here and see the situation is half and half. While it seems that half of the reads are normal and there is a normal splicing happening, and on the other half, exon 14 is skipped. So in conclusion, it seems that due to this mutation that happens at the end of exon 14, exon 14 is skipped. I told you we had two splice. The second one was also a splice donor mutation. We did the same kind of RNA sequencing analysis in, in the second mutation. Uh, the result was basically the same due to the second mutation, exon 8 has been skipped. Then we had to establish, so 
up till here, we have three mutations. We know that each of them caused loss of a major part of the protein, and we wanted to functionally characterize this mutation. We needed an in vitro system for that. And we started using Q cells. These cells do not have endogenous IFIH1. The first step was to transfect them with a lentiviral vector to make them be able to express IFIH1. That went successfully. And as you can see on the left-hand panel, the cells that were unable to introduce, uh, to induce interferon beta, now they can induce interferon beta open infection either with viruses or with double-stranded RNA. We tested replication rate of different viruses in these cells after, before and after in the uh, transfection with IFIH1. Here you see the results for, uh, for RSV, and as you can see here, in the presence of IFIH1, the, mm, the red line and the green line the virus replicates less efficiently. Then we wanted to know more about the, the character, character, we wanted to deeply characterize each of the mutations separately. Here again, you see the wild type, the same kind of in vitro system. You see that the wild type protein can induce interferon beta, and this induction increases open the addition of double-stranded RNA. Here are these two parts. And on the other hand, all the three mutations, they stay largely inactive. They cannot induce interferon beta in the presence or absence of the RNA ligand. What was really interesting to us was these last bars. When we co-express the wild type and the mutant, the wild, the wild type seemed to lo loses or reduces in its ability to induce interferon beta in the absence or presence of the ligand. In the next step, we looked at the st stability of the wild type and the mutant protein. On the left hand, you see that the wild type has a half-life of about eight hours. It's much more stable than all the three mutants. On the right hand, you see that again, when we co-express the wild type with e either of the mutants, the stability of the wild type decreases. So altogether, we concluded that the mutant proteins were not functional and they affect the functionality of the, they interfere with the functionality of the wild type protein. So in conclusion, what I presented here, we believe it's a new representation of a pathogen-specific primary immune deficiencies due to loss, loss of function mutations in IFIH1. And on top of the clinical implications that this can have, our approach shows the power of extreme phenotype sampling in infectious disorders and the potential of human genomics as a tool to dissect innate immunity. Thank you.